This is the stupidest thing that I have ever heard. There's a professor at Vanderbilt University. He teaches mathematics. He's an assistant professor, actually. His name is Louis Leva, L-E-Y-V-A. Louis, or Luis, probably, L-U-I-S. Luis Leva, who is a professor of math at Vanderbilt University, who gave a lecture. This is the title of the lecture. Are you ready for this? Undergraduate mathematics education as a white cis heteropatriarchal space and opportunities for structural disruption to advance queer of color justice. This is like the word salad that you would get if you gave directions to that AI thing, that chat GPT thing, and told them to make a word salad of woke intersectionality nonsense. Undergraduate mathematics education as a white cis heteropatriarchal space. Do you know how long that word is? cis heteropatriarchal space and opportunities for structural disruption to advance queer of color justice. This is what the guy looks like, if you're wondering. This is the professor. This is how he announced, this is how, by the way, he gave this speech, this lecture, at the largest mathematics conference in the United States. This is now, so it, what that means is this nonsense is being disseminated into not just, not just math, but into the entire STEM field. Painting math as being racist, as being sexist, as being homophobic, um, and as being cis-heteropatriarchal. So what does this even mean? I don't mean that question rhetorically. When I say, what does this even mean? I'm not, I'm, I'm not asking like, oh my goodness, will you look at that? No, I want to break down what this actual actually means because his description of, that's the title of his, of his, spe- of his lecture, his description actually tells us everything we need to know. If you haven't already subscribed to the show, please do so. Go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, click that subscribe button. On YouTube, click subscribe and also click the bell so I can notify you of every new episode that we post, every interview, every video. We have a lot of new content for you all the time on rumble.com slash Liz Wheeler. Hit the subscribe button over there. Let's get to it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Genucel New Year's clearance event. I got you a fantastic deal. For a limited time, you can save over 70% off Genucel's most popular package, which will help you take care of all your skincare needs. You can actually turn back the clock with Genucel skincare, and you can look five, 10, even 15 years younger. You can watch those horrible fine lines that we all hate and we all have. Forehead wrinkles, sagging jawline, dark marks, skin redness, and even those under eye bags gone right before your eyes. Genucel works for women and for men. It's safe for all skin types and it is perfect for skin of any age. And with its immediate effects, Genucel promises results that will make you smile guaranteed or 100% of your money back. Right now, get Genucel's customer favorite, their deep firming vitamin C serum, absolutely free in every most popular package. Go to genucel.com slash Liz and enter Liz at checkout. Every order placed, by the way, is automatically upgraded to free shipping for the new year. So don't wait. Go to genucel.com slash Liz. That's G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash Liz. Genucel.com slash Liz. Okay, so this professor of mathematics, an assistant professor of mathematics, he teaches at Vanderbilt University. His name is Luis Leva. He claims that mathematics education, and we're talking about like undergraduate, we're not even talking about graduate classes. Undergraduate math is cis-heteropatriarchal. Cis-heteropatriarchal, I dare you to say that five times as fast as you can, but you won't be able to do it. This is how he describes the lecture that he gave at one of the largest mathematics conferences in the entire United States. He, this is how he describes his lecture. He says, he will depict how black, Latin, asterisk, and Asian QT, queer dash transgender, students' narratives of experience reflect forms of intersectionality or instances of oppression and resistance at intersecting systems of white supremacy and cis heteropatriarchy. Like, what does that even mean? What does that even mean? Here's the thing. I actually don't mean that rhetorically. I, I want to break down exactly what he means by each one of each one of these words or pseudo words that he has invented or adopted. So he's talking about depicting black or Latin asterisk. So this is his way of not saying Latino, not saying Latina, not saying Latin, but putting an asterisk there 
depending on how you identify. I find this to be extremely dehumanizing. What could be more dehumanizing than putting an asterisk in the description of someone's cultural heritage? This is what, this is what anti-Semites and white supremacists do to erase Jews. They won't write out the entire word. They use an asterisk instead. And so he's doing this here to be ultra uber woke. Like at first it was Latin and it was just a generalized term for both male and female of Latino, Latina, Hispanic descent. Then it became, it became gendered Latina or Latino. Then the wokesters try to make it Latin X or Latinx, however you want to pronounce it. I guess it's irrelevant. It's a stupid word, a made up word. And now he's putting an asterisk in erasing literally part of these people's cultural heritage. I find that extremely insulting. I found that extremely demeaning. Then he says, findings depict how black, Latin, asterisk, and Asian QT, queer transgender students, narratives of experience. Well, so what's a narrative of experience? A narrative of experience is not an experience. A narrative of experience is a perception. Now that's very different. That's, that's a fa- that's, uh, an experience is a fact. A narrative of experience is a feeling. A perception is a feeling. Now you, your perception can reflect reality, but oftentimes, Perception does not reflect reality. That's actually where we get the idiom, perception is reality, because oftentimes people perceive things differently than they really are, and therefore to that person, what didn't happen, but they perceived to have happened, is what they believe to have really happened. But it's not. And the thing about that is that's not just, that's not just a facet of human nature when you have these radical leftists who are telling, telling students telling students how to rewrite their experience, telling students that even if you didn't feel X, Y, Z in a certain situation, looking back on it now, this is what you ought to have felt. It's like in Prince Harry's book, Spare. I don't know if you guys noticed this when you were, y'all read through it, right? Of course you did. When you were, when we were reading through it, how, how Prince Harry often said, I didn't realize it at the time, or I didn't see it at the time, but dot, dot, dot. And then he'd make some kind of woke take. So in other words, what he was doing is he was saying, well, at the time, whatever happened was fine and I felt a certain way. But now that Meghan Markle is in my ear telling me that I am oppressed as the prince of England, the prince of, as a British prince, um, telling me that I'm oppressed as one of the wealthiest people in the world, the most powerful people in the world. Now that I understand that, now that I'm being, being indoctrinated, I'm reforming my thoughts to view the reality of what happened in a different way, shifting perception. So that's what, that's what this professor, Luis Leva, means when he says students' narratives of experience. A narrative of experience is a perception. It is not reality. So students' narrative of experiences reflect forms of intersectionality. So what is intersectionality? Intersectionality is a, a woke term. And I know that there's a war going on right now over the word woke. What is woke? How do you define that term? Oftentimes, conservatives answer that question the way that the Supreme Court defined pornography. Well, you'll know it when you see it. You know, you know woke when you see it. You understand what woke means when it's being indoctrinated into your children at school, when you're hearing it in the boardroom at work, when, you're, when your college student is being subject to this in, in the policies, even the admission policies, the DEI policies at college. You know woke when you see it. But you can actually define woke further than that. Woke is the way of describing the cultural Marxism that has infiltrated the American left, the American Democratic Party, and the liberal apparatus that surrounds the Democratic Party. Woke is neo-Marxism. It's neo-Marxism just by a different name. And and it's, it's easy to prove this definition when you look at something like intersectionality. Intersectionality, for example, was a term that was coined by a, another college professor by the name of Kimberly Crenshaw. You might be familiar with the name Kimberly Crenshaw because Kimberly Crenshaw is also the woman who coined the phrase critical race theorist. Kimberly Crenshaw admitted that she and her contemporaries are critical theorists who do race. So that's a little bit to unpack. A critical theorist, what's a critical theorist? Well, a critical theorist is someone who adheres to critical theory. Critical theory is a school of thought that was, that was conceived at the Frankfurt School in Germany. The Frankfurt School that was originally named the Institute for Marxism, but the founders thought, well, 
the Institute for Marxism as a name might get some pushback. We might be criticized here. We should, we should call it something else. We should call it, you know, the Institute for Social Research. It became known as the Frankfurt School, but it begot this whole new generation of cultural Marxists. Marxists who bought into almost everything that Karl Marx said, but instead of thinking that a Marxist revolution would be sparked by the working class trying to overthrow the ruling class, the Frankfurt School Marxists understood that a Marxist revolution would be begot, be begot if only if cultural institutions are infiltrated with neo-Marxist ideology first. Therefore, they worked through this framework of critical theory. Critical theory is actually quite self-explanatory. It means looking at a certain institution, like the education system, for example, or marriage, or even sex. And, and family is a good example of this. And criticizing, levying, constant criticism, usually from a Marxist philosophy framework, at this institution until the institution itself falls, at which time these critical theorists wanted to are usher in socialist, communist, collectivist, or outright Marxist institutions in its stead. So Kimberly Crenshaw, the woman who, who coined the term critical race theory here in the United States, called herself a critical theorist who does race. What she means by that is she buys into the Marxist structure, the Marxist idea, and this goes back even to Karl Marx, even further back than the Frankfurt School. Karl Marx's entire premise of, of his version of communism was, was the idea that everyone is either oppressed or an oppressor. And the people who are oppressed should rebel against those who are levying the oppression. And once that revolution has taken place, well, Marxism as a government structure will, will take form here. Kimberly Crenshaw buys into that, but she adds the racial element. That's why critical race theory is often called racialized Marxism. Because instead of it just being an economic Oppressed, oppressed versus oppressor dynamic, critical race theory adds race to it, makes it about race. Well, that's what we're seeing taught in elementary schools, right? That white children are taught that they are inherently oppressors. Black children are taught they are inherently oppressed. What is, what is the culmination of this? The culmination of this will at some point not just be the racial tension that we, that we see at the highest levels in our country in decades, things that we thought we'd gotten past in our nation, the result of this will be an outright race war. And this is the hope of the critical theorists who do race. They want to divide our nation in such a way that the so-called oppressed class wages revolution on the so-called oppressor class, and the ultimate outcome of this will be Marxism. Of course it will be Marxism. Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined critical race theory and admitted that um, she and her contemporaries are critical theorists who do race. She was also instrumental in defining intersectionality. Intersectionality. Intersectionality is pretty much the same thing, just applied to a different topic. While critical race theory looks at ra the racial elements, Karl Marx's version looks at the economic elements, intersectionality can look at anything. Any two things can be tied together. And from that, any two things, by the way, when I say any two things can be tied together, any two topics where a certain demographic is labeled as oppressed and a certain demographic is labeled as the oppressor can be, can be related to each other. It doesn't have to just be men versus women, black people versus white people, rich people versus poor people. It can also be men versus black people or women versus white men. It, intersectionality is, um, is a Marxist idea that combines things, and from that we get this invented word, this, this word that this college professor at Vandal, Vanderbilt University uses, cis-heteropatriarchy. This is all one word, cis-heteropatriarchy, and I want to break that word itself down, because when we break that word down, we see exactly what he is hoping to achieve. But first, I want to talk to you about four patriots. A food shortage could be coming, even here in the United States. This is what experts wrote as recently as July. Drought, inflation, and new political policies are pushing America's food supply near its breaking point. It's scary. That's why survival food is more important than ever. I encourage you to do what I did and create your own stockpile of the best-selling four patriots survival food kits. It's not ordinary food. We're talking good for 25 years in case of an emergency, super survival food. It's hand-packed right in a family-owned facility in the U.S., giving jobs to over 200 Americans, which is also a bonus. The kits themselves where the food is stored are compact, 
They're sturdy, they're water resistant, they stack easily for storage. They have different delicious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, and you can make these meals in less than 20 minutes. It's super easy. You just add boiling water, you simmer, and you serve. And right now, you can go to fourpatriots.com and use code Liz to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store. Just go to fourpatriots.com and use code Liz to get 10% off. That's fourpatriots.com, code Liz, to start building your own stockpile today. Okay, so back to this lecture description. It's, it's amazing in one sense that so much is said in the space of one paragraph, this lecture description. We're going to start over. He's going to discuss, this professor discussed, I should say, this speech already happened, findings depicting how black, Latin, asterisk, and Asian, QT, queer, transgender students' narratives of experience reflect forms of intersectionality or instances of oppression and resistance at intersection, intersecting systems of white supremacy and cis-heteropatriarchy. Makes a lot more sense once it's unpacked, doesn't it? You can see exactly what he's doing. And he's doing this, you, you would expect this from someone like Kimberly Crenshaw. You'd expect this from someone like the author of the 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones. You'd expect this from uh, a, a, a race Marxist like Ibram Kendi. You would expect this from, from these, these Marxist grifters. It's not quite as expected in a mathematics department at Vanderbilt University. This is what he says. He says, I apply my framework and research findings to argue how undergraduate mathematics education operates as a white, cis heteropatriarchal space that limits learning opportunities affirming of queer or color, of queer of color identities and experiences. I conclude by reimagining undergraduate mathematics education with structural disruptions that advance justice for learners marginalized across intersections of race, gender, and sexuality. Well, that's a mouthful, isn't it? I had to read that about five times before the show. Uh, little phrase by little phrase, to be like, what is he trying to say here? The, the core of what he's trying to say is that he wants even a math classroom. Like, think about when you're a freshman in college and you go into, you go into your required mathematics credit class. Maybe this is like algebra two. Maybe this is trigonometry. I'm talking like elementary level college courses here because we're not talking about graduate level stuff. We're not talking about advanced degrees. We're not even necessarily talking about calculus. I think I, my freshman year of college, I did not take a math course because I tested out because I had taken calculus in high school. But then as a sophomore, I took algebra two as an elective because I knew it would be easy. And I took calculus one and calculus two. So even if we're talking about these, these fairly basic, fairly elementary math courses, I know a lot of people, one of my sisters took algebra one and algebra two as, as her math. She wasn't in any kind of science field and she took that as her, as her math credits. But essentially what he's saying is that when you walk into algebra one, algebra two, trigonometry, calculus one, things that you probably learned in high school but probably forgot even in the year or two since you've been in high school, he wants that space to brainwash you with queer theory. He doesn't want you to learn about the Pythagorean theorem. He doesn't want you to learn how to calculate the volume of a, of a sphere, things that you would do in a math class. He doesn't want you to, I don't know, learn about different things in calculus that I would like to think that I remember, but I probably have forgotten because it's been so many years. He, this is what he said. I apply my framework and research findings to argue how undergraduate mathematics education operates as a white, cis-heteropatriarchal space that limits learning opportunities affirming of queer of color identities and experiences. So that word affirming is the key word. If you don't walk into that classroom and have your mathematics professor, who's supposed to be a nerd wearing glasses with tape around his nose, a pocket protector, and a big old calculator, if that person doesn't say, before we get started today, I'd like everyone to know that there are 127 genders, that my neo-Marxist pronouns are Z and Zer, and that nobody in this class can use a male bathroom or a female bathroom because there is no such thing, and everyone can use this, this communal urinal in the corner for, you know, for inclusivity. If, if the professor doesn't get up and say something like that, then apparently this is limiting learning opportunities. This is where it gets very dangerous because this is the same sort of disingenuous argument as when the left tells us that our words are actual hate. Our words, not not hate, our words are actual violence. 
Like a word cannot be violent. A word is a word. A word is not, is not harming someone. It might hurt someone's feelings. It might offend somebody. But a word is not violence. A, f- a fist punching you in the face is violence. Being assaulted is violence. Being run over by a car is violence. There's physical violence, and then there's just, you know, rude behavior. Perhaps the words are hateful. They might be, but that doesn't make them violence. But that's what the left has done when it comes to free speech. That's how they're actually trying to undermine free speech right now, by telling us that anything that we say, especially when it comes to COVID or transgenderism, queer theory, critical race theory, election integrity, that all of these things, that our words are actual violence. Not that they beget violence. Not that they encourage violence. Not that they incite violence. Not that they do any of those things. But that they are actual, literal violence. This is the same, this is the same, it's not logic. This is the same principle, framework, I should say. This is the same framework that this professor at Vanderbilt University, Luis Leva, is applying to the idea that if math professors don't profess queer theory, that they are limiting a learning opportunity. Because here's the thing. If you are a young man and you have same-sex attraction, you are not rejected from a university mathematics program or a class because of that. If you are someone who has purple hair or green hair, someone who thinks that they are someone who has pronouns on their Instagram bio, but you have a high ACT score and SAT score, you are not, you are not discriminated against because of the color of your hair, because you think other people should have to use your neo-Marxist pronouns, even though we won't. And we'll talk about that in a minute. There is not institutional discrimination against LGBTQ identifying people at the mathematics level, at, especially at public universities. Private universities, it's not discrimination. Some of them require for admittance, adherence to the morals or the religious doctrine of the school. If it's a Catholic school, for example, or a Baptist school, sometimes they require students to sign pledges and say, listen, I adhere to, I, I believe the tenets on which your school is found. That's different. What he's talking about is, a pub, is, is public education, public education that does not, I repeat, does not suffer from institutional discrimination against gay people. Because it does not, because gay people are not institutionally rejected from math classes at public universities based on the fact that they have same-sex attraction or because they think they're a boy even though they're a girl, because they don't face that, he has to take this to another level. He has to say, well, if you don't actively celebrate this, if you don't pass this along, if you don't indoctrinate the other students in queer theory, then then LGBTQ students, queer students might feel uncomfortable just being around you if you have a different opinion. And if they're uncomfortable, well, then they're not, that, that limits their ability to learn. Because if you don't have a comfortable space, how do you learn? This is the argument that he is making. That the only place that queer students can be comfortable is in a space where their sexuality is discussed publicly, where the professor affirms them in, their, in their, the choices that they make about their body and their sexual partners, that's really weird. And it's not only weird, it's, it's, it's insulting and it's demeaning and it's false to insinuate that the really smart people who exist in our country from all kinds of identities, whether it's, race, whether it's racial, and you know that I don't, I don't put I, uh, immutable characteristics as primary identity, but all kinds of students of different racial backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, different uh, different sexes, male or female, and yes, people, some people who have same-sex attraction, some people who have heterosexual attraction. This is really insulting to think that they would be unable to learn unless their sexuality is discussed publicly. It's also, by the way, Marxist. It's outright Marxist. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. But first, I want to talk about this new app that I really like. I think you'll like it too. Now, it's called Upside. You may not know this about me, but I really love taking pictures, both professional photography and also lots of pictures of my daughter. However, this kind of hobby can get very expensive, especially with the price heights lately, which is why I have to tell you about Upside. Upside is my new favorite way to save money. It's an incredible app for anyone who's struggling with inflated prices, whether this is, you know, buying gas or groceries, dining out, With Upside, I get cash back on every purchase that I can then use to fund all of the pictures that I want to print to put in all of the photo albums. It's basically cash back just for doing what you were going to do anyway, which helps you offset inflated prices. 
The app also is super easy to use. To get started, you just have to download the free Upside app, and then you can use my promo code, Liz, I got you a good deal here, to get 25 cents, an extra 25 cents back for every gallon on your first tank of gas. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside, then pay as usual with a credit or debit card, follow the steps in the app, and voila, you get paid. In comparison to credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. Upside users are earning hundreds of dollars a year. So download the free Upside app, use promo code LIZ5 to get an extra 25 cents back for every gallon on your first tank of gas. That's an extra 25 cents back for every gallon on your first tank of gas using promo code LIZ. But first, download the free Upside app. Okay, so not only is this insulting and demeaning and false, to claim first that there's institutional discrimination against people who identify as queer when it comes to taking math classes in college, that's false. It's insulting to people of all types of immutable characteristics to claim that they cannot succeed unless their sexuality is discussed and unless unless they are surrounded by people who agree with them 100%. That's, That's a really coddling belief. You don't have a lot of faith in someone if you think that they can't survive in a situation where someone might disagree with them. It's also, of course, a horrible accusation for towards all of the people who run mathematics departments, all of the math professors who just want to teach one plus one, for goodness sakes, that they're somehow limiting the learning opportunities for queer students because they're not also teaching queer theory. Um, But here's the other thing. This word that the professor uses cis-heteropatriarchy. There's no such thing as cis. That's an invented word. That's not true. Cis, there, there's no such thing as cis. There's men and there's women. There's no cisgender. Even gender is a made-up word. G- gender is a, is a, uh, it's a, it's a made-up word that was meant to replace sex because it's so obvious that sex is male or female. Well, the queer theorists wanted to pretend that gender, sex, is not binary, so they essentially brought in this word gender because they say, well, we can define that as identity, not just reality. But here's the thing, math is not even predominantly an invention of white people. Not that this should matter, it's just also important to note. Math itself, the person that's like credited as being the founder of mathematics was a Greek named Archimedes. And then, get this, the father of algebra is from Baghdad in modern day Iraq. This is his name, Mohabed Ib Musa al Khwarizmi, from Baghdad in the Middle East. Mathematics is not an invention of the white man, not that it would make a difference if it were, but just, just, just to make the point here, that this professor at Vanderbilt saying that it's a, a, a white supremacist intersectionality with cis heteropatriarchy, blah, 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 word salad, word salad. Not even a white person, not even a white person invention. See, this is the problem that the woke woke left, the neo-Marxists have with mathematics. Mathematics is objective truth. One plus one equals two. Two plus two equals four. Four plus four equals eight. Those things simply are. They are true. There's nothing that you can do to warp that. There's nothing you can do to change that. It is. It, It is fact. Marxists do not like objective truth. Reality is the biggest opponent of Marxism. And this right here is the, this, this, this war on objective truth, this war on reality, this is actually the root cause of every other cultural thing, especially as it relates to the federal government right now, that we're dealing with in our country. So when the FBI targets parents, when the Department of Homeland Security labels parents as domestic terrorists for uh, objecting to critical race theory in their children's classrooms and objecting to queer theory, when um, the Department of Justice goes after pro-lifers who are anti-abortion and doesn't go after the abortion fanatics that firebomb pro-life crisis pregnancy centers, when the FBI and the Department of Justice and the current president of the United States target the former president of the United States with a raid at his residence, This is all tied together. Right now, what the left is doing is they're waging a war on reality. Objective truth is their biggest threat. I recently had a conversation with a dear friend. We've been friends our entire lives. And we agree on most things. We agree on 
on we're both we're both Christian. We uh, I actually don't know how she votes. But for the most part, we agree on 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 the principles of how we see life, except for the fact that she has pronouns in her Instagram bio. And I asked her about that a couple weeks ago. And she said to me, and we we have these conversations. We've always had these conversations. It's one of the really nice things about our friendship. And she said to me, listen, Liz, as a teacher, I will call my students anything they want. I will call them whatever name they tell me. If, you know, if someone whose legal name is John Smith comes up and says, hey, um, hey, I might call me cheeky. She's like, I'll call him cheeky. I'll call him whatever he wants to be called, even if it's stupid for the sake of demonstrating to him respect. And she's like, the same goes for pronouns. She's like, if that's what they want to be called, I will show them the respect. Even if I, even if I don't agree with the premise of what they're saying, I'll show them the respect. I'm not going to make pronouns a battlefield. Why should it be a battlefield? Why doesn't it, why can't it be a discussion? And now I obviously disagree with this, right? I, I, I think it's, it's two separate things. I think it's fine if, uh, if to call someone by whatever name they ask. I actually do the same thing. If there's someone who says, hey, I'm a transgender person and it's obviously a biological male, but you know, call me Molly. I'll call that person Molly because there are a lot of stupid first names. <laughs> there are also people, doesn't Gwyneth Paltrow have a daughter named Apple? Like I'm not gonna walk up to Apple and be like, well, I think that's a fundamentally stupid name for a human being. It's actually the name of a piece of fruit. Therefore, I reject calling you by your name. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that girl Apple because that's fine. It's not, in, it's not an inherent uh, commentary on any kind of ideology. It's just a, a dumb name. So I, I understand that. I understand if, if someone wants to be called a name that doesn't, that's a traditionally female name, even though they are a biological male. I might think it's dumb, but I'll call you that. I don't feel the same way about neo Marxist pronouns. I will not use neo Marxist pronouns because using neo Marxist pronouns is being complicit, it's endorsing the ideology that underpins the neo Marxist pronouns. And the ideology that underpins the neo Marxist pronouns is, of course, queer theory. We've discussed queer theory at length on the show multiple times. We've discussed how queer theory not only rejects the gender binary and, and posits that gender is a spectrum, not based on science, that queer theory is begot. It is a critical theory as well. It's begot of a Marxist theory. We've also talked about how awful and evil queer theory and the founders of queer theory are. How the founder, the authoress of the founding document of queer theory, a woman by the name of Gail Rubin, a lesbian named Gail Rubin, how she advocated for the sexualization of children. She defended child pornography and she defended outright pedophilia. She defended pedophiles and bemoaned the fact that they were put in prison for the crime of quote unquote, loving underage youth, which is disgusting. It's, it's really shocking. This is queer theory and why I won't use neo-Marxist pronouns because it's not just a matter of, oh, I'll call someone what they ask to be called, no. It, it requires you to be complicit in queer theory, which is both neo-Marxist and horribly destructive to children. This is the difference. This is, this is why this math professor is attacking math, because math is, in a sense, the same as sex. It's objective reality. It's, it's, there are certain things that are true and certain things that are false. And the reason that we teach math in school is not because calculus is helpful in 99.9% .9 of career fields, Yet we teach math to every single student. So why do we teach math then? We teach math because it helps us train our minds for how to think logically. It helps us train our minds how to correctly discern right from wrong, how to solve a problem when you have certain variables that are true and you reorganize them and calculate what the, what the result is. All of, all, all of that, is not possible without first acknowledging that certain variables are objective truth. So of course mathematics is a fundamental threat to this neo-Marxist agenda because the opponent, the biggest threat to the neo-Marxist agenda is reality. It's objective truth. By the way, this professor, I think I mentioned it a couple times, he teaches at Vanderbilt University. And when I read this at first, I thought, of course, naturally he teaches at Vanderbilt University. He's not just a mathematics professor, he also works in their uh, gender and sexuality department. Of course he does. But Vanderbilt University, as, remember, as you remember, um, was caught by Matt Walsh operating a children's gender clinic. Now these children's gender clinics, that's, even that's a euphemistic name. It's where people, where, where doctors mal, commit malpractice 
by prescribing young children puberty blocking medication that's that's inherently damaging to them. And Vanderbilt University's Children's Gender Clinic was caught transing minors, including performing surgery on young girls who were under the age of 18. This is the school where this math professor, where this math professor works. Of course it is. Of course it is. Okay. One other thing that I want to talk about today, which is completely unrelated, although a little mathematics ed- education helping train your mind to think logically and deduce the outcome of a situation based on algorithmic variables, that would be extremely helpful right now for many politicians in the United States. The United States is on the cusp of sending tanks to Ukraine. They claim that this is in advance of an expected Russian offensive, so we're sending M1 Abrams tanks to Ukraine. This is a bananas idea because Zelensky is a fraud. This is a position that I have taken firmly on this show almost from day one, almost from day one. I remember the day that I realized that Zelensky wasn't just a politician with a slightly different ideology, maybe a different set of interests here. The day I realized Zelensky was a fraud was the day that he called for the United States and NATO to enforce a no-fly zone over Ukraine. And I thought, whoa, Zelensky calling for the US and NATO to enforce a no-fly zone means that he wants the US and NATO forces to actually shoot down Russian jets if they infringe on Ukrainian airspace. And if the US or NATO shoots down a Russian jet, what happens? Then the US and NATO are now part of World War III. We're part of a war with Russia, probably a nuclear war with Russia. And I thought to myself, any person, politician, who calls for that, especially when you're the president of a country, meaning you should have some education about politics and the ramifications of of political actions, any person that would call for that, any politician that would stand for that is psycho. Truly psycho. Zelensky is a fraud. He actively wants an Afghanistan-style forever war in Ukraine, where the United States, he's bleeding the United States hemorrhaging the United States for trillions of dollars, and he wants it to continue indefinitely. What's his end goal? I don't know. When you talk about an end goal, he just he, he wears his combat boots and, and stages one of those videos, which, by the way, are literally staged with a green screen. He stages one of those videos talking about the fighting spirit of Ukrainian people conflating the two. The Ukrainian people do have an incredible fighting spirit. You can recognize that and also recognize that Zelensky is a fraud that is actively endangering his people. We should not give Zelensky another dime. We have come to the point where we should not be giving him any more weapons or supports unless, unless we, the United States, are controlling his actions. I don't care if this sounds like I'm saying the United States should boss around Zelensky and what he does for his country. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. We should be bossing Zelensky around if we are funding his lifestyle. It's like sending a child off to college. If a child pays for college themselves, they don't have to share their grades or their weekend activities with their parents. They're independent. But if the parent is paying for the child's college, then yeah, the parent has a right to log in and see the child's grades. The parent has a right to ask, what are you doing on the weekends? And govern the child's behavior because that child's lifestyle is being funded by the parent. We are the parent in this situation, and Zelensky is a misbehaved teenager who is about to draw the United States into nuclear war with Russia. What he needs to do, and what the United States, a a, a string the United States should attach to any more funding, any more resources, any more support, is that he settle the war. Reach a settlement with Putin. I know Putin is in the wrong. No one's arguing that he's in the right here. Putin is in the wrong. It's, it's egregious what he's done. We all agree on that. Settle the war. Even if that means, yes, surrendering different parts of your land to Russia. This is what happens. I know that's not ideal, but this is what happens when you support radical leftist policies that get us into a situation like this, a situation that I like to call a lose-lose situation. You don't have good choices when you're in a lose-lose situation. But it doesn't mean that the United States should fund a forever war that ultimately you're still probably not going to win, but our money is going to be used to profit Zelensky and other very radical leftist interests. What I'm talking about 
is the World Economic Forum. Zelensky's partnering with the World Economic Forum and BlackRock for quote unquote investment into his economy and his country. The World Economic Forum, which doesn't even believe in capitalism, they want a, this neo-Marxist Chinese Communist Party style ESG dictated social credit score system to control people, can control corporations and businesses and the economy to serve the interests of their radical leftist ideology. BlackRock's the enforcer of this. BlackRock's the, one of the largest investment firms in the world and one of the predominant voices forcing ESG standards, these environmental, social, and governance metrics which serve as these, these corporate social credit scores on corporations all across the country and all across the world, not just our country. And Zelensky wants their investment. He wants their control over his economy. Meanwhile, he's soaking us for our money. I don't think so. Zelensky is a fraud. Zelensky is a hoax. Zelensky is a very, very dangerous man who has duped politicians on both sides of the aisle. He's duped Democrats. He's duped Republicans. And he, if we allow this to continue, he's duping us as well. And what's going to be the end of this? We are going to be broke. BlackRock and the World Economic Forum are going to control that part of the world. And we are at risk of being drawn into a nuclear war with Russia. Who does that? And who allows it? If you missed episodes from earlier in the week, I highly recommend you go back and check out Antifa Targets Atlanta. This is some crazy stuff that's happening down in Atlanta. And it's not just the, the, the burning up or the arson against police cars that's crazy. That video is crazy, but it's also the reason behind it. The reason behind it is we have a young white male problem in our country, just like the left says we do, except these are not young white men who are being radicalized on 4chan. These are young white men who are being radicalized by the left to act as militant Antifa thugs. Don't, don't miss that episode if you haven't already seen it. Also, at Davos, Davos, the World Economic Forum annual gathering last year at Davos, new footage has been unearthed of uh, the pandemic plot that was discussed, or I should say this was 2019, not last year, the pandemic plot that was discovered or that was discussed just a couple months before an almost identical real life scenario, COVID-19 hit the globe. This is really, really interesting. I talked to a uh, great investigative journalist, Jordan Schachtel. Also, Gavin Newsom, the gover governor of California, calls the Second Amendment a suicide pact. This is what the man wants for our country, and mark my words, he will run for president. If not in 2024, then he will run in 2028. And of course, in that episode, we talk about that Damar Hamlin video. I have lots and lots of thoughts on that. So if you haven't already seen those, you can go to Apple, you can go to Spotify, you can go to YouTube, you can go to Rumble. Check them out. Let me know what you think. Thank you for watching today. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.